Welcome. This is a research-based presentation on what we know about trauma and its impact on career counseling. So this is going to be an explanation of trauma and then what we as career counselors can do with people who have trauma in their past. So without further ado, first of all, I want to be clear on what we mean by trauma-informed care. This slide shows that there are two types of trauma services. There's the trauma-specific services, which are those programs and interventions and therapeutic programs and services that are designed to treat the symptoms and conditions. Those are your programs. Those are your um, therapists, like Annette, who are actually dealing with people and helping them with their trauma. What we're doing is more trauma-informed care. So this is basically an approach based on knowledge about the impact of trauma. We're not actually doing therapy on trauma. We're, we're using our services informed of trauma and its impact on people. So the first thing that we need to think about when we're talking about trauma is understanding brain development. So we actually are backing all the way up here to birth and we're thinking about how the brain develops. And what happens uh, at birth is you're born with a certain number of neurons, which you have approximately the same number of neurons throughout your whole life. What changes are the connections that are made between those neurons, those synapses? And from birth to three, there's a, a truly overproduction of synapses. Um, this is when your brain is exposed to things. It just has an explosion of connections because it's, it's kind of trial by error. It's just making, making lots and lots of these connections. Now, pathways, these connections that are used over and over again, they become strengthened and grow stronger. And then during a period of what's called pruning, the pathways that are unused uh, become atrophied and disappear. Ultimately, what happens is you end up with a brain that's far more efficient after it's been pruned. Before that, at three, there's just a lot of chaos and confusion going on. And, that, and it's like I said, it's just it's kind of building itself through trial and error. And we can see that not all of those synapses are being developed at the same time. Some are developed earlier, others are developed later. And what we see here is that this explosion of synapses, there's over 700 synapses being formed per second in the early years. Your brain, the brain is just making all these connections. And the first ones that it's making, and actually if you look at that uh, yellow or that kind of red band, that's the first year and it actually goes into in utero when you know, at about five months, the brain is actually developing some of those sensory pathways and those connections are being made in utero and even the language is beginning to be developed. And then in that first year of birth, there's just an explosion of synapses and then they begin to trail off. Now, the sensory pathways come first and then trail off, then language and then higher cognition comes later in, in the development. And as we well know, that, that continues on into their you know, mid-20s um, when their frontal lobes are fully developed. So that's what's happening at these early ages. Now, what could possibly delay or disrupt this brain development? And this is where we find that toxic stress is something that delays that development. And toxic stress is stress that is unsoothed. It's chronically unsoothed stress. There is good stress. There's first day of school good stress. There's potty training stress. There's, you know, uh, overcoming challenges stress. But those stresses, the good stresses, are soothed by some adult who helps them and their, their, their system understand how to soothe themselves, it soothes them and understands how to soothe them. Toxic stress is produced when there is abuse, neglect, or family dysfunction. And what happens is when that, when, when that is unsoothed, their bodies produce an overload of cortisol and adrenaline. And that is hugely damaging to the brain because it's, it's just always present. And therefore, it's delaying development. And it actually is detrimental to the, to the inflammatory system, which is a system that helps your body deal with infections and injuries. 
also the overproduction stresses the system out to where then later it doesn't produce the right amount of cortisol and adrenaline, which can then cause um, emotional dysregulation and unable to feel things that other people feel. So we have this, this damaging levels of cortisol and adrenaline flooding the brain at this important time where connections should be being made and being pruned. And what happens is this has long-term consequences for health, emotional regulation, relationships, et cetera. And we're gonna go into more detail about all that. But this brain development at this critical stage of being under 18 is, is a big part of how we as counselors who are dealing with adults need to understand that these childhood experiences have had impacts that we then uh, might be dealing with later with, with adults. So let's get a little bit more into this childhood experiences and let's look at the ACEs. This is um, a CDC and Kaiser data collection. The CDC has published this ACEs study, it's Adverse Childhood Experiences study on their website. You can download it and we're going to be going through it in some detail here. This was over 17,000 participants, collected data from 95 to 97. These were all people who had health insurance and were going to Kaiser. And then the CDC collaborated with Kaiser on this study. Interestingly enough, it started out as a study in an obesity center. And they noticed that some of the people that they were treating had some experiences. And then they said, I wonder how prevalent that is. So they began measuring abuse, neglect, and childhood dysfunction. They had a questionnaire that they gave, and then they produced a screening mechanism. And the screening mechanism tells you what they mean by abuse, neglect, and, and dysfunction. So this is something that's available now. I'm not suggesting that we use this in our practice, but I wanna take a good look at it so that we understand it, and we wanna see what this is about. So if you look at the first one, did you feel that you didn't have enough to eat, had to wear dirty clothes, or had no one to protect or take care of you? So that's the physical neglect. Then, did you lose a parent through divorce, abandonment, death, or other reasons? That's considered household dysfunction or challenges. Did you live with anyone who was depressed, mentally ill, or attempted suicide? Did you live with anyone who had problems with drinking or using drugs, including prescription drugs? Did your parent or adult at home ever hit, punch, beat, or threaten to harm or each other? And did you live with anyone who went to jail or prison? Did your parents or adults in your home ever swear at you, insult you, or put you down? That's the emotional abuse. And then the physical abuse is, did your parents or adults in your home ever hit, kick, or physically hurt you, not each other, but you? And did you feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were special, that's emotional neglect. And then the last one, sexual abuse. Did you ever experience unwanted sexual contact? Now, these are the questions that they asked, and when they asked them, they had no idea the prevalence with which they were gonna find this in a population. Now remember, this is skewing to a population that is more affluent and actually more white because everyone there had health care and was seeking medical attention at Kaiser. So it's not even, I mean, it's, it's fairly representative, but it's not even like a truly representative uh, random sample of humanity. So let's take a look. So emotional neglect. 10% of people uh, surveyed uh, felt that they were um, neglected physically. 23% had abandonment issues. 19% grew up with someone who had attempted suicide or was mentally ill or depressed. 27% of people grew up with a household where there was drug abuse or alcohol abuse. 13% um, were in abusive households where they, the, the, there was physical abuse between the people in the house. And then 5% had people who were in the house who were incarcerated highest percentage in the whole world. And 11% suffered emotional abuse, 28% suffered physical abuse, 15% suffered neglect, emotional neglect, and 22% of people suffered sexual abuse. 
So as you can see, there is quite a bit of abuse, neglect, and dysfunction within our population. Surprising amounts. I think anyone who hadn't seen this before would be alarmed to know that this level of, these are all childhood experiences. Now, now we think about the dosing and we look at, you know, how many people have had a score of, you know, zero, one, two, three, four or more. So each of those 10 questions, if you answered yes to, you would get an, uh, a one. And fully two thirds of Americans have at least one ACEs. And if you have one, you're 87% likely to have more than one. So only one third have, have no ACEs at all. And when you begin to think about this as a population, you begin to realize just how many people are walking around out there with these experiences. Now, the next thing we're gonna go do is talk about how those experiences manifest themselves in lots of ways. Well, this is the first one. So students with three or more ACEs are two and a half times more likely to fail a grade, to score lower on standardized tests, have language difficulties, be suspended or expelled, be designated as special education, and have poor health. So that's just with three or more. We look at early drug use. If you have zero ACEs, you're you're less than 1% of people with zero ACEs have early drug use. Whereas if you have four or more ACEs, you have 10% of that population. We're talking about orders of magnitude here. This is, you're 10 times more likely to use drugs if you have five or more ACEs before the age 14. And then of course, following upon that early drug use is injection drug use. You can see that there's this stair step and you're just gonna see this over and over again. When you have zero ACEs, it's far less likely that you will use injection drugs. That you will become an ad addict. So these are addiction scores. So you're looking at 10 times more likely to be addicted to drugs if you have five or more ACEs versus no ACEs. Teen sexual behavior. You're far more likely to have intercourse by the age of 15 if you have more ACEs scores. Therefore, you're likely to be pregnant and the prevalence of teen paternity is also exponentially more probable if you have ACEs in your past. Alcoholism, again, direct correlation between number of ACEs scores and alcoholism and the likelihood that you will be married to an alcoholic. You've got lifetime depression, the stair step. And perhaps one of the more stunning ones is this attempted suicide. With this one, you can see that you're almost 20 times more likely to attempt suicide if you have four or more ACEs than if you have no ACEs at all. This also sees itself in homelessness. It sees itself in suspension, expulsions, and youth probation. It looks at recidivism and reoffense after felonies. And then we look and see that DSM diagnoses, just it's incredible that, you know, with, with four or three or four more ACEs, that you're looking at six or eight diagnoses, DSM diagnoses. These aren't diagnoses anymore. These are constellations of diagnoses. And this is based upon ACEs scores. Now, not only have they been able to look at associations, because what we're showing you is associations, they've been able to give attribution to ACEs. And this shows you the attributable effects of ACEs on various social ills. So 54% of depression can be attributed to ACEs, 43% to homelessness, 58% to attempted suicides, 50% to drug use, 65% to alcoholism, there's life dissatisfaction, 78% for IV drug use, promiscuity, domestic violence, disability days. Um, all of these things are attributable to a large degree. So think about if we were able to do something about ACEs, how much we would be attacking these social ills. 
Now we're particularly interested in employment. And this is where we have data that shows that if you have four or more ACEs, if you add those together, those that are unable to work and those that are unemployed, you're talking about 25% of people who have four or more ACEs that are just not employed. And why is that? Well, you've got absenteeism goes up with, uh, with ACEs. You've got serious financial problems going up with ACEs. You have serious performance problems going up with ACEs. So this shows you that things that happen in your childhood, that early traumas and stress predictably damage the brain development and, and produce behaviors and traits that slows language processing, the lateralization of your brain is off, diminished IQ, poor decision-making, memory problems, ADHD, ADHD, aggressive behavior, social isolation, poor understanding of social cues, and when that happens, frequently you have conflicts. This, of course, sets them up for significant risk of early abuse, alcoholism, tobacco, illicit drugs, which then causes special education, school failure, dropout, suspension, expulsion, delinquency, puts them into the prison pipeline, and then causes adult adversity, where you've got low wages, unemployment, public assistance, prisons, chronic health problems, mental and health substance abuse problems. Another way to look at this and another way the CDC demonstrates this is through their pyramid. And here we see that at conception, you're born into a family that could have historical trauma. And we know that trauma and abuse is passed down through generations. So if you're born into a house that has history of trauma, you're likely to suffer trauma similar to your parents. And then the local conditions, where you live. Remember, you're born. You don't have any control over any of this. You're born into a family. You're born into a community. And that community, if it has drug abuse or crime or poverty, that's, that's surrounding you as well, which contributes to your possibility of getting adverse childhood experiences, which then disrupts your, your neurodevelopment, which then causes social, emotional, cognitive impairment, which then has you adopting risky health and decision-making behavior, which then causes disease, disability, social problems, which can ultimately end in an early death. So this pyramid, it's a pyramid because you're not destined to it. Just because you're born into a family with ACEs doesn't mean they're going to pass it on to you. And just because you're born into a poverty neighborhood doesn't mean that you're not going to get the care you need. But the, there, is go, there is a higher probability. And all of those probabilities pile up. So where we see kids in, in the programs is when they've adopted those risky behaviors. So we have to think very carefully about whether they have had social and cognitive impairments, whether they have had disruptive neurodevelopment and had childhood, uh, adverse childhood experiences. So the summary of the findings is that adverse childhood experiences are common. Two thirds of everyone has at least one. They threaten, we saw that loud and clear, and that they're often denied. Um, they're not usually, you don't know that about your friends when you meet them. They're not usually sharing their adverse childhood experiences with you. So um, you may not know that, they, that they're there. They have a profound effect on addiction, health risks, disease, and death. That they are the leading determinant of health and social well-being and a major factor underlining addiction. And that they are responsible for a big chunk of workplace absenteeism and the cost of healthcare, emergency response, medical health, and criminal justice. And the more ACEs you have, the greater risk for chronic disease, mental illness, violence, and being a victim of violence. Put another way, ACEs, they have found strongly graded relationships between the breadth of exposure to abuse or household dysfunction during childhood and multiple risk factors for several of the leading causes of death in adults. So what do we do with this? Now at Kaiser, what they did was they did another experiment where they had what they called a trauma-oriented approach. So they started asking everyone about their biomedical evaluations and they gave an extensive 
uh, history that you would give. And that was the control group. In the sample group, in the uncontrolled group, they actually asked additional questions about childhood experiences and trauma-related experiences. And what they found was when they took a biomedical evaluation, they uh, saw an 11% reduction in doctor office visits in subsequent years. And then when they asked the biophysical questions about their childhood experiences and, and, sub, and previous traumas, and said, how do you think that affects your, your well-being now? They saw that with that added question and added intervention, that they had a 35% reduction in doctor office visits. And that's with 120,000 person sample size. So you can see that for Kaiser, doctor office visits are very expensive. So this slight intervention had a huge impact on their doctor office visits. So what blunts all of this childhood trauma? We know that it doesn't automatically equate to adverse adult experiences. So what is the, the, the antidote to childhood experiences is resilience. So what is resilience? It's the ability to adapt successfully to acute stress, trauma, or more chronic forms of adversity. So there is a resilience assessment that asks questions like, I believe that my mother and father loved me when I was little. Now, the, the way you answer this is by saying definitely true, prob probably true, not sure, probably not true, definitely not true. And in the resilience assessment, you want a high score. So a probably or definitely true is a positive score. And I've highlighted what is the aspect of the question. So you, you can see from this that first two questions are about mother and father. Did they love me? And then were there other people that helped my mother and father and seemed to love me? And then if we look at the other ones, someone in my family enjoyed playing with me. Uh, there were relatives in my family who made me feel better, better when I was sad. Neighbors and friends, teachers, coaches, youth leaders, ministers. Someone in my family cared how I was doing at school. My family and neighbors talked about how to make my life better. There were rules in my house that were expected to keep. When I felt bad, I could find someone to talk to. As a youth, I, people noticed that I was capable. Notice how all of those other things are environmental or other persons. The last two questions, I was an independent go-getter, I believe that life is what you make it, are the only two internal questions that they ask in this entire resiliency scale. So much of it is about the environment and the people who were there to help you. And those people do the self-soothing, that the, they teach that self-soothing, they blunt that trauma because they're there to help regulate those emotions and tamp down that cortisol levels and adrenaline levels that are coursing through a, a young person's body when they're under stress. And then this is how you, you basically circle. So then there's a question in the industry, is resilience a state, meaning something that is there, or is it a trait that is inherent in you, right? Is it something that's built around you and, and a, a moment in time or something that's internal? And the answer is yes. <laughs> it, is, it is both. It is something that is possessed, that is internal, but it is also something that can fluctuate. So that state of being uh, is something that can, can change over time. And what they found is that with treatment, resilience can be measured and improved. And actually, the measurement of their resilience is an indicator of their effectiveness of treatment. And the Connor Davidson Resiliency Scale is used by some practices to show how much growth is being accomplished in a treatment plan because they know that a higher resilience is going to lead to better outcomes in the end. For our purposes, I'm not advocating the use of it because we're not therapists and dealing with that trauma-specific service. We're that um, trauma-informed, but I wanted you to be aware of how closely 
resilience is related to improved outcomes and how resilience is the antidote to adverse childhood experiences. So for our purposes, what I want us to avoid are these errors in thinking about resilience. The danger is that we think that resilience is a personal characteristic independent of social factors. That whole, you know, oh, it's just your makeup. Well, we know that it's, it's not just your makeup. That's a part of it, but a bigger part of it is your environmental factors. We also don't want you thinking that simply empowering clients' personal agency is enough to promote change. And this has been shown through research, Mastin and Powers, that this is not real. Uh, that thinking that you only need to adjust the client's mindset is, is all that you need to do. It, it's more than that. You can't just tell them to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. So I hope through this presentation you see that these experiences and how you build resilience may not be any fault of their own and simply telling them to get over it is not a successful or useful strategy. So what are best practices? And I'm, this is to be practiced by therapists, not by career counselors. Uh, but I just wanted you to see this slide so you understood the complexity of the problem. That trauma is a complex, multi-dimensional construct with multiple interacting factors. There are stresses and um, risks and protective factors in both the individual and in the community and the social network. It's a complicated genetic environmental interplay. There's the neurochemistry of how their brain was developed when they were growing up. There's even the epigenetics where their experiences are actually changing their genetic code, changing the expression of their genes, which once changed, they then can pass on to their children. So they're actually changing the building blocks of their own being through these experiences and what is called epigenetics. And then there's a psychological habituation of all of these things. So this is what it takes to deal with it, not telling people to get over it and change their attitude and, and, and move forward, okay? So what should we as career counselors do? Well, first, and that the point of this whole thing is to help you understand the effects of ACEs on brain development. We saw how ACEs affects all sorts of developmental issues. We don't want to judge clients with what we consider character flaws, which may be the results of ACEs and toxic stress. We need to be informed, trauma informed. We are informed of these things, therefore we are not passing judgment. We are establishing trust and building healthy relationships. We are being complimentary and positive, accentuating their strengths and accomplishments. And we are modeling healthy adult behaviors. That's what we can do. And the Greenwood system, our research shows that first we need to help them learn about themselves and envision a positive future. We then need to have them explore careers for which they are a good match and develop an action plan that helps them achieve their career goals and what's called action plan development. So this is what we should be doing as career counselors. Now, there is some research that is talking about the narrative approach to career counseling based in constructivism and social constructivism seems well suited. This is not conclusive, this is not evidence-based, but this is the conjecture of researchers saying it seems well suited for trauma-informed approach to career counseling. And I would encourage you to go back and watch our life design career construction postmodern career counseling presentation that is in our video vault. So you can see more about Savickas and others and what they mean by social constructivism and, and career counseling in a life design model. So they're thinking that this is a good idea. And then Zaramsky talks about how the willingness to listen deeply to clients' stories can do much to validate their life experiences. And he is a humanistic counselor, not necessarily a career counselor, but we're still adopting sort of that listening aspect, that deep listening to their stories. So in the narrative approach, 
if you were to use it, the, the way that they think that it's helpful is it conceptualizes the self-regulation issues. So it allows you to understand why those self-regulations issue exist because of their negative consequences of ACEs. It allows you then to also reframe those symptoms and understand them as adaptive responses to these negative consequences of these ACEs. And then in the life design model, you're providing support by modeling, teaching, guiding through an adaptive kind of life design model. Now, we use life design in the Greenwood system because in the self-exploration, we're creating that self-narrative. And this is where through the structured interview and when you're asking about the earliest memories of career aspirations, you're listening for stories about their past. You're looking for those strengths and opportunities for improvement. You're look, asking them their three wishes, um, their definitions of personal success. You're asking about their books, interests, experience, personal attributes, families, et cetera. All of these things are allowing them to write that self-narrative, to create that story, to tell you that story of who they are. And you're listening deeply to that. And you're asking them, what do they value and what motivates them? And you're pulling all of that information into those purpose and passions synthesis statements, which then create the lens through which you look at the jobs. So this life design in the Greenwood system is done in that self-exploration phase. And then you create the action plan, which tests that hypothesis, where they say, this is who I am, this is what I want. Then when you create that action plan, you're saying, all right, let's go give that a try. Let's go give you an opportunity to realize that existence and see if it does match what you think it is. And if it is, great, let's go forward with that. If not, maybe let's look at another action plan. Let's look at another avenue to take. So the takeaways from this presentation. First, I want you to understand that early toxic stress can negatively impact brain development and it can be measured with ACEs. High ACEs scores have been attributed to many long-term mental health, physical health challenges and negatively impact the careers and life fulfillment aspirations. Our clients may have these. They may have these, especially if they've had three or more adverse childhood experiences. Resiliency can blunt this, but it's largely a product of their environment and it can, it can change over time. So, just be aware that it's not an internal intrinsic value that they lack. It may be that the environment didn't help them. And, and there may also be internal aspects of it too, but also realizing that this is something that is not just born into, but something that is modeled and helped produce by people who love and care for you and create an environment where that can be appropriately developed. So as a result, you should listen deeply to clients' stories to help them understand their past and present as it relates to their future careers. Go through that self-exploration. Listen to what they're telling you about who they are, about what they want, and be present for that conversation. Be sure you're listening and responding and, and affirming their experiences and make sure that they know that you have their best interests in mind and heart, and you're there with them through this experience. Then you help them envision a positive future by researching career options for which they're a good match, giving them a new pathway to a new future, one that they're excited about. And then develop that action plan to give them the steps towards that new future so that they have actionable things that they can do to make that new reality, to overcome adversities in the past, overcome adversities that are present in the present, and, um, and to really become that person that they want to become. So here is the bibliography. So in the future, you can pause the screen and access all of these resources that informed this presentation. As I mentioned, it was heavily research-based, bringing to you the most up-to-date 
research that's being published in 2019 and some of the later studies um, about all of that that's going on. Dan, can I add on a point? Please. Please. Yes. This is the Q and A and the the where you bring your expertise to the presentation. So Annette, please share. I mean, it is excellent. First of all, thank you very much. Really spot on. Um, but I was just going. I was just thinking as we were going through this, how often you don't know when you will be the person who might be that person who they first tell this story to. And um, certainly the way that the whole questionnaire and the supportive questionnaire has some psychological aspects to that, that helps someone feel comfortable with you, that they may say something to you that they wouldn't say to somebody else. Like, um, you know, so this, I, I mean, I guess what I'm just trying to say is that when you find that somebody's got some of these ACEs, you may be the first person they've revealed some of these to. And it may be also why they're even coming for career counseling why they keep getting stuck. And um, I know that it can be a great time to refer someone for therapy to make sure that they can follow through on their great Greenwood testing advice or guidance. Because you know, oftentimes why they're stuck or why they're coming in for career counseling is other kind of therapeutic reasons. Um, certainly I've noticed that in, in a lot of my clients that are testing and they're over like 25. It isn't just that they kind of got lost or didn't know what to do. Um, they also have other things that are holding them back and it's therapeutic stuff. So um, I certainly think that's how I got to meet you, Janet. That's how we started meeting was sometimes uh, you would have to refer someone to people like me. Yeah. Um, I always said that, uh, when families know that you're not only a career counselor, that you have uh, some training in counseling, they, they are oftentimes more likely to send their, their teens to you. Um, and, uh, and it ended up a lot of times sending kids to special needs programs. Um, but, but we also found that giving them a career direction was extremely helpful. Uh, the kids really responded to that, so it was uh, it was an interesting uh, an interesting time. Yeah, and Beth and I do career counseling, but we are not trained as therapists, and and we have advised you and trained you uh, not to conduct therapy in the context of career counseling. That the the two are very distinctly different, and what you said, Annette, is exactly exactly what we've coached everyone to do is if you run into these and you think that there are issues that are being unattended, that is an excellent time to make referrals to therapists. And that way you're able to keep it separate and apart from the career counseling, which is supposed to be positive, affirming, and forward thinking. As we saw, dealing with trauma is, is hugely complex and you don't have, I don't have the time, I don't also have the training and the expertise to conduct it. So that would be where we would refer out and Annette has been, you know, the recipient of a lot of Greenwood clients or referrals. So she does an excellent job and that's not what we do. So it's not what we're proposing that you do. And I'm also not proposing that you give the ACEs screening tool to your clients that might invite you know that conversation they may by asking that you're actually seem open and willing to talk about it and that's not what we're promoting here but it's different in our programs where therapists are doing therapy with the clients or students as well as doing the career counseling so there is that combination when it's done by our therapists in the programs correct yeah true good point Beth. yep Thank you, Annette. That, that's a, a great conversation to have at the end of where we're talking about all this and, and what is our role in responding, asking, reacting. And I hope I'm getting across that I'm not proposing that you be the therapist to their trauma, but be informed that it may be the reason, like you say, at 25, they're lost and it may not be for any other reason. 
but you're still there to help them find out what the, the next move is. Excellent. Hey, hey Dan, I think um, something all career counselors can do when you're looking at the, uh, the history of trauma is you can, you can find the factors of resilience. Um, Donald Meichenbaum did a lot of research on what makes the difference. Um, and, you know, looking for those support systems, those people, those guardian angels is what Donald Eichenbaum called them. It's the people that help the kid get out of a circumstance or those institutions or churches or the people in their life that help them like regroup and end up in your office looking at their future. You know, identifying those strengths and those supports can really be helpful, especially on the career research side. And um, that's just... I, I, try, I try to work from the strengths perspective in the career counseling. So just a thought. And I think, I think Donald Michael was next door neighbors with Janet there for a while. <laughs> he was, he was across <laughs> the street. <laughs> yeah. In, in Clearwater, Florida. Yeah. He was across the street. <laughs> yeah. But I tell you that the danger really is, you know, how to navigate that whole business about whether to step into any of those issues. Um, because it can really change the conversation. Um, and, uh, and depending on how you navigate that whole experience with your client, um, maybe that's, maybe that's uh, the way you'd like to adopt your practice. Um, people can adopt their practice in different ways. I was very uh, clear in my practice not to try to go into those issues because I found early on that it completely diverted and everybody was off in a different uh, way of thinking and it brought up some painful um, things and, um, and it interrupted my process. So I was very quick to refer out um, at, you know, at the end, but certainly to listen deeply as Dan said to what they had to say and to validate their thinking, but then to move on as quickly as possible, quite frankly. Great. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, that's uh, that strengths-based approach, that leveraging their, you know, those attributes that they have to lean on. Absolutely. Any other thoughts, suggestions, questions? Yeah, I have, I have a, a little bit of a question. I'm not sure how to an, like ask it, but uh, so I typically work with um, autistic young adults, and uh, one of the things that I run into is as we're going through the Greenwood and looking at careers, career options, and and what would best suit some of my students. Uh, sometimes I experience uh, what almost seems like students are uh, almost like it's they're feeling some a little bit of trauma or like terrified to actually look at like a future career and I get a lot of like hesitation pushback and almost like almost like they're it's it's so scary for them to look at a career and think that I should move forward that it almost seems like it's traumatic for some of my young adults how mm -hmm. Do you approach it or have you experienced anything like that with other clients that you guys have worked with? And what do you suggest? Yeah. So the, the Greenwood system, as you well know, is, is constantly having them make tiny little decisions. First, to sort their priorities. Then to articulate their priorities, then to prioritize their priorities. So they're constantly making these, it's not a big, hey, what do you want to do with your life question, which is overwhelming. It's broken down so that these small little decisions that they make build and build until you get a mission statement. And hopefully they're excited about that mission statement. Yes, I want a job where I do X, Y, and Z and live like A, B, and C. So that, that development, that self-exploration uh, that, that culminates in the development of their purpose and passion synthesis statements is really important and, and is broken down. Then the exploration with the links is meant to be fun. Click, watch videos, click, watch videos, think, think, in, indicate interest, indicate interest, indicate no interest. Again, not hopefully not pressure as much as fun exploration, 
the, the stressor could be when you have to then, you had 100, now you got 20, deciding which are those 10. You know, and, and the way that, that I've done that, I have a small two minute video that again, turns that into a series of smaller decisions where you take those 20 jobs and you rechunk them into what makes sense. Here are the jobs that involve medicine. Here are the jobs that are teaching jobs. Here are the jobs that are therapy jobs. So you chunk them apart again, and then you sort within, oh, of these medicine jobs, which one would you want to be number one? Of these teaching jobs, which one would you want to be number one? Of these therapeutic jobs, which ones would you be number one? Again, making smaller and smaller decisions. Now, and then which of these chunks, you know, which, like, do you want therapy before medicine or teaching? And so, again, they're, they're making these smaller decisions. And then all of a sudden, in the upper left-hand corner is that job. So try and, and, and make it a series of smaller decisions that don't seem as threatening and, and, and make it fun and exciting to learn about these different jobs. But yeah, there, but that's not to dismiss, Tyler. There is a thing called career readiness. And, you know, if a, if a kid's not ready to be thinking about their future, there's nothing you can do. So it's not a, oh, this works for every kid all the time. You just have to go through the Greenwood system. No, that's, that's not what I'm saying. But for kids that are willing to think about their future, you can reduce their anxiety by having them make smaller decisions towards that big decision. But just also recognize that if if they're being more, if you just want to jingleize it, if they're being more willful than willing, then it's not going to work. No, um, it's, it's not the right time. Go ahead. Yeah, I'd just like to add one thing. You know, he's talking about them being fearful and the exceptionalities. I mean, what I would do would be to take their top 100, run that exceptionalities for social, you know, uh, you know, what is the, what is the, in the exceptionalities, what is it if they are on the spectrum? There are so social skills issues there. There's social, social skills issues. And so I would, I would immediately go to that and resort his, their careers uh, in light of that. So which careers require the least amount of social interaction in that way? Um, and then I would start there. Yeah, I'd like to add that it's been helpful for me with some of my students on the spectrum to um, rearrange some of the steps and make the sessions really small. Um, running that e ECR first um, once they've done the assessment so I can get a sense of how to be a little bit more guiding. And then also um, while they're exploring and trying to nail down those top choices um, having subtle um, action plans that are like pre-action plans um, along the way where they can potentially plug into an activity or an environment or a volunteer situation where there are some transferable skills, um, like a little bit of an extension of the interview um, with an individual and have that be part of how they're um, getting down their final answers because it's really hard for them to conceptualize um, what it would be like. And so um, I run into a lot of what you're seeing as well. And I'm just thinking outside the box a little bit for the individual. Excellent. Thank you, Natalie. No, thank, thank you for the input. That was really good, Natalie and, and Dr. Dan. That was, yeah, I appreciate that info. That's, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, our pleasure. Okay, guys, it's a few minutes after 10. Thank you so much uh, for being here, th for contributing. I really appreciate the opportunity to share this information with you. And yes, thanks for joining us. It was great to see you guys. Yeah, stay safe, wear your masks. <laughs> and your galoshes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. All right, take care. Thank you guys so much. Bye-bye. Take care.